the red lights. I am sitting here today in the house of Rick and Kim Miles. Some of you around this state know him as J. Eric Miles or Rick Miles. What a particularly exciting interview for me today as 28 years ago when I started my teaching career, Rick was my mentor teacher. So it's such a pleasure and a privilege to be with him today. I know many of you have been looking forward to this interview. I think he's doing pretty darn well. So let's get started. Yes, ma'am. And um, question number one is, why did you decide to become a band director? And what were the influences, the circumstances that began your band journey? Well, it was a, an enjoyable time. I started off as an elementary student in Dade County, Florida. And I was, an, uh, I was the only musical classes that I had were your regular everyday music class, but I did enjoy singing and was selected a number of times to represent the school in all county chorus things, elementary choruses. We used to have our production in the Orange Bowl and the elementary chorus would sit up in the end zone, the closed end zone of the Orange Bowl, and the high school chorus would sit next to us, and then there'd be a band on the field, very often conducted by Fred McCall and by uh, Henry Fillmore, and uh, some of those, those names that we've, we've grown up with. And it was really impressive to me, and they'd always have a demo band, a band like uh, Miami High School and, and the Hialeah Thoroughbred with Logan Turrentine, and I was particularly taken by them because I had a cousin that was in that band. And I was amazed at what the bands could do on the field and sound musical. And about the same time that, that I was doing all of that, two other things happened. I saw a movie called The Glenn Miller Story with Jane Stewart and uh, June Allison. And it had a real severe impact on me. I, I just loved the way the uh, musicians interacted and made music and seemed to enjoy their life. And I thought that was something that I really wanted to do rather than just spending my life singing. And then the junior high school band from, that I would be going to came to my elementary school and did a program like many of you middle school directors are doing now. And it struck me at that time that I was going to be able to do it. And so I decided that I would study music seriously. And I was lucky enough when we moved back to Florida that I went into the uh, band with uh, Ed Parsons as the director. And he pushed us musically to a level that I never ever thought we could achieve. We did not know how good we really were. And when I then went through high school at MacArthur, my last director there was Don Bradley, who I interviewed a few months ago. And it was a joy to do the things that we did. So when I got ready to go into college, I had auditioned for the Army Band, but decided at the last minute, rather than going down for the induction, I was gonna stay and go to college. And I thought, well, what am I going to do when I'm in college? And, the, and what I answered myself was, what did you enjoy in your life so far? And it was playing my instrument. And I decided that if I could bring that joy to some children in the world, even though I had no desire, no idea that I would ever be able to teach, I decided that teaching would be a good way to, to pay the bills while I was writing music because I really wanted to be a composer. And I found out pretty soon that I might be an okay arranger, but as far as composers go, I'm not that. <laughs> and I found out that I could arrange music while I was still teaching and could enjoy that portion of my life. So that's how I got into teaching. Where'd you go to college? I did go to college. I went kind of a, a number of things. I had a partial scholarship to the University of Miami and played and did, played my audition for Fred McCall, but it was just a tiny little scholarship. I could barely pay for my books in the first semester. So I decided I'd go and I finished at Broward College for the first couple of years. And then I was headed off to Florida State and my life kind of took a little twist and found out that I was just gonna stay down here. So I ended up going to Florida Atlantic which, when there was I think five instrumentalists in total at Florida Atlantic at the time. So again, I ended up spending a lot of time with a choral group and with the, with the choruses there and did a lot of singing and got out of college. And actually I graduated on a Saturday and on Tuesday of the next week, I was teaching in an elementary school that had lost a direct, their teacher. And 
the school was going to have to integrate next year. And so I was hired my first job because I was white and they were going to have to integrate the school population, which was all black. And so I went in as a token white and uh, that was my first job. And I, I found out that the kids needed so much music that I would stay there for the next year. And so I taught from April to June of one year and then the whole next year and we started a band. We, con we contacted citizens in, the, uh, in Broward County and asked them to donate instruments. So that's when I learned how to repair instruments because a lot of the instruments that came in needed all kinds of work. So I had to repair them and fix them so the kids could play them before we could actually perform. We had a band of, I think we ended up with 14 by the time I left. And we were playing some really exciting things out of the beginning band book. But then I got an opportunity to go back to the school that I interned in with Bill Lawson, who many of you may remember, who was truly the person that I stole the most from in my career. And I always tell people that I am the sum total of all the directors who I have watched and stolen things from. And uh, I've stolen from many of you out there, even though you might not know it. Because if I've ever seen you working a band, I've stolen from you. And I haven't ever given you credit, but I am now. So that's kind of how I got involved with it. And, and where was that? What, what? Have, you, have you been your whole career in Broward County? My entire career has been in Broward County. The elementary school that I started in was in Pompano. It was a migrant school, and uh, I left there and went to Perry where I had interned, and left Perry and went to Olson. And I was at Olson for a good long time, and I kind of helped the south end of the county get back into taking their bands to contests, as we called it back then, because at the time I started taking Olson, there was only Pompano and Sunrise Junior High School that were involved and I guess Parkway was a little bit, and then they, they kind of faded away for a while. But uh, we, we hosted it once, and then I left Olson and went to South Plantation, and left South Plantation to go back with my, here's a, here's a bit of news and a bit of advice for all of you guys. When you find a principal that understands what you're doing and knows the value of what you're doing, stick with them. I worked with the same principal at three different schools and would have gone to the fourth school, but it was a private school and he had retired and I wasn't ready to retire yet. But his philosophy was the band students needed not to be out raising money to, to fund the music program and that he trusted me that I would not buy anything that I didn't need and that I wouldn't waste any money, but he would get us, give us everything that we needed. And he did in three different schools. So the last school that I worked with him in was Walter C. Young, which we opened. And then I retired for the first time. And I went to, uh, <laughs> went to full, uh, full time church ministry and developed an orchestra and a choir and uh, began to write music and arrange music for that. And then they were beginning to cut orchestra programs in Broward County. And so I went back to Flanagan High School and taught there for seven years until they were going to replace, find somebody to do the orchestra. But I got to assistant band, direct the band, and direct the orchestra and teach guitar for a bunch of years until I tried to retire my third, second time, which didn't take because then I went to Parkway Middle School where I taught orchestra and beginning orchestra for three years until they found someone to replace me and I found that person too. And then I retired for my third time and that's all been in Broward County, yes. And so I'm now in my third, third year of retirement. For the second time. <laughs> For the second time, yes. So um, in Broward County, you had a great principal for, for a good long stretch of time. But yes, I there did. had to have been things that you encountered, issues that you worked your way through that perhaps would help some of our younger directors today. Old music libraries, old instruments. I, I became the scavenger of instruments whenever, whenever instruments would be uh, salvaged and put in the county office. I would go down and find what, what, would, what looked like I could rebuild or have rebuilt to build up my instrument uh, inventory. I found a whole bunch of 
B-flat horns that everyone was casting away. Well, I had some single F horns, and what I found out that I would do is, I, I, I got my principal to buy me some nice double horns, but I would start my beginners in two classes, one with the F horns and one with the B-flat horns, and at the middle of the year, I would switch horns, give the kids that had the F horns the B-flat horns, and vice versa, so that when they got into the eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, I could give them a double horn and say, look, you've got both the horns that you learned, and now you've got the best of both worlds. <clears throat> you can play the low notes and the high notes now because you've worked on both of those, so that helped my horn section. And I found, when I only had one bassoon at Olson, I found a bassoon that had been junked, and all it needed was an, an upper, uh, upper section, upper stack, and uh, I talked to my friend at the music store, and we found a, an upper stack that would work. And I ended up having two bassoons for nothing except getting the upper stack put on. And uh, that kind of thing I had put up with. And old music libraries. So I became the king of borrowing music. I would hear a band's program, and I would go and borrow some of their music and take it to my kids and let them play it. And then I remembered to get it back to everyone. And I, I've gone back to some of my schools to try to find some of that music that we had there. And it's been loaned away and not returned. So please, when you borrow music, get it back to the people that you borrowed it from. Because that's how we, we get ourselves going sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, there were, some, there were some principals that I worked for for a year after my previous, my favorite principal would leave. And they would not be as understanding. They would sometimes say, well, you can't schedule like this because this is just not the way you schedule. And I would say to them, all right, I understand where, where you're coming from, but if you want to be able to have a band and have all of those upper, upper level classes, then this is the way scheduling has to take place. And occasionally they have to come to that realization after a year of having a, a bad schedule problem. But three times in my life, I had assistant principals come to me and say, now what was that way we scheduled the bands so that we can get everything worked out without a great bunch of schedule changes? And I became real friendly with the guidance department so that they would uh, let me come down and do the schedule changes that needed to be done so that I could get the kids that I needed where I needed them and keep them in their advanced classes. And that worked with me in all the schools. That's a critical thing, I think. The, you know, getting to be real good friends with the head custodian is a wonderful thing. And the principal secretary that we, we find out very soon has a whole lot more to do with running the school than sometimes the administrators do. And so when you get the principal secretary on your side, you've got an, ad, you've got an advocate and, uh, and you can very often get things to go your way that don't always go when your principal doesn't see eye to eye with you. So there's a lot of educational work that needs to go on with administrators, if you know what I mean, folks. <laughs> Pay close attention. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, when I was in high school, you were at South Plantation, but when you were my mentor teacher, I think at that point you were teaching middle school. Yes, I was. And um, what were some pivotal moments you had success no matter what middle school you were at. You had success at South Plantation. What, if there are any pivotal moments that, that really brought you into just figuring out how this thing works? Listening to bands. I spent my life listening to bands. I never missed going to a, a county music festival. I listened to the middle school bands that played when I could hear them and the high school bands all the time. And I went to high, sc high school state contests and I went to other band concerts. That was, that was instilled in me with Ed Parsons. When I was in Ed Parsons' junior high school band, we used to go up to War Memorial Auditorium and listen to the Fort Lauderdale band. Because at that time, Fort Lauderdale was around and Stranahan was around and South Broward was around. And that was about it in Broward County. And so we'd go up there and listen to those bands and listen to how they sounded. And I, I spent my life going to other people's schools and listening to them, and as I said before, watching how they did what they did. Sometimes I'd be pleased with what they did and I'd come back to my school and try it. Sometimes I'd try it and it would fail. And that's one of the best messages I can tell you guys, is what works for me might not work for you, but maybe you can vary it in some way that it will work for you. 
I certainly found some things some directors did that I promised I would never ever do in any of my band career, any of my band situations. And I, I always would stop myself if I found myself falling into one of those traps. And so I tried to copy, and as I said before, steal from as many people as possible. I was very lucky to have <clears throat> an opportunity to work with composers. Paul Yoder and Harold Walters lived right here in Broward County. And I happened to fall into a group of band directors with Bill Lawson and Ed Parsons being two of the main ones that would get together with Paul Yoder and Harold Walters and they would have their manuscript of their most recent piece of music and they'd pass it out to us band directors sitting around in the living room and we'd play like Hurricane, Paul Yoder's Hurricane. We, we'd play it before it was ever put out to anybody to play or even taken to the publishers to have it printed and we'd be reading the manuscript and to pick those brains of the, of the people that were there uh, and to listen to what they had to say was just marvelous. Part of the reason that I stayed in Broward County is I had no reason to go anywhere else. I had people here in Broward County that I could, I mean, Bentley Shellahammer, Cindy Berry, Dwayne Hendon, Fred Humphreys, Neil Jenkins. I didn't have to go more than five miles from my house to listen to unbelievably superior quality bands. I can remember Fred Humphreys doing a Pines of Rome one year at state contest. And I sat in the audience and cried. It was so beautiful. And I would pick his brain to try to find out how he did what he did. And the same thing with Dwayne Hendon and with Bentley and Cindy and with, with Neil. I happened to be a band parent for Neil. So I got to work with Neil Jenkins when he was at Miramar a bit. And he would come and work with my band and I would steal from him and would steal from everyone. Yes, Ms. Cole, I stole from you as well. <laughs> I did. And I don't, I don't shy from telling people about that. And have I answered the question or have I strayed? I think you've done just fine. Um, so Rick, is there any one thing or multiple things about your personal character that you think have contributed <clears throat> to your success? Well, yes, I think there's a couple of things about me. First of all, I, I know what it's supposed to sound like because I've listened to enough people make that sound and I will not settle for anything except what it's supposed to sound like. One of the things that you'll never hear me say is take the course of least resistance or don't sweat the small stuff. I've never ever heard a successful musician or a successful banker or architect say, don't sweat the small stuff. My friends, it's all about the small stuff. You have to take care of the small stuff and let the big stuff take care of itself because if you take care enough of the small problems, you don't have any big problems. I started, I learned very early on, teach the kids how to make a good sound. And the way I felt like doing that was have a demonstration of a good sound. And you can't always afford to bring in somebody that has the good sound to demonstrate it for your students. And so what I chose to do was like Bill Lawson did, and that was learn how to make a good sound and play every instrument to the point where I could demonstrate to my children what it was supposed to sound like. And I was not embarrassed to play in front of them, and I would like to encourage all of you to keep playing your instruments. It was your love of your instrument that got you into this in the first place. You gotta find a place to play your instrument. And don't be afraid to play it in front of your, uh, in front of your students. But I was personally involved musically with my students. I would play duets with kids when they got to the point that they could play the uh, Rubank book duets and the Close book duets. I'd get in there and play them with them and get them to th think like a musician. And that I thought was, was critical to it, but uh, it, was, it was a love of music. And w the thing that I had to instill in my kids was pride, pride in their instrument, first of all, to take care of their instrument because it will take care of you. And, you know, certainly check it over daily to see what it needs done and then fix it, get, have it fixed. And then pride in your rehearsal, your practicing. I never did practice logs and things like that. I instilled in the kids the importance of practice and we had regular tests on scales and rudiments back in the days of rudiments. And my, my goal was to get them to be responsible 
for their practicing and take pride in the sound that they made so that our band sounds would be a sound that they were very proud of. And later I boiled it down to these three things. And I have this still hanging in my garage from one of the signs we had on, the, on, on my wall in the last couple of schools. And it was uh, dedication, motivation, and discipline. And if you are proud of what you're doing and you take care of dedication, you're dedicated to practicing, dedicated to your band, and you motivate yourself because I can only motivate people so far. The motivation has to come from within the student as well as the discipline has to come from within the student. I didn't want to spend my life disciplining students, but all I had to do was look at them and let them know that they weren't disciplining themselves. And that's a difficult thing for a lot of folks to do, but it can be done with middle school kids as well. So it's the pride and the knowledge of th that you know what you want and don't give up until you get it. That, that, well, I think that those things describe you too. Disciplined and dedicated and motivated, and they've described you for years. Well, and I thank you. It has been, uh, it has been a joy to, to work with the students and with FBA. I've, I, I always, and, and I recommend highly that you, know, you take your bands and have them evaluated I still look back at the sheets written by Harold Bachman and Charlie Quarmby and uh, F. Lewis Jones when they were judging me or my bands. And I would look at them before I would start to really seriously prepare my kids for their MPA and look back at those things because they're true about every band. And I would, I would work on those things. They're valuable pieces of, of information. And within your county, there are old folks like myself that would love to just spend some time talking to you, ask us questions. It took me, I think, four years of teaching before I had enough courage to go to Chuck Ulrich and say, Chuck, how, how do I figure out what a BR drum is? And he looked at me and says, that's a brake drum, Sonny. And I said, <laughs> a brake drum like on a car? He said, oh, yes. And uh, so I had no idea. I spent a, a year trying to figure out what a BR drum was. And I was just embarrassed to ask anybody. And none of us come out of school knowing everything. Gracious, that's so true. I mean, you get the piece of paper on your wall which tells you you can go out in public schools and learn to do what you spent all that money in college trying to learn how to do. And you've got some good ideas, but you've got to pick the brains of the people that are around you. Find some people that you respect. And while I'm on this, let me just stray one more time. Don't stick with just band directors. Part of my joy is that I also do, I, I do sing still. I spent 10 years singing w opera, and that was a wonderful thing to be on stage and lo see some of my friends down in the pits, down in the pit playing the music, and I'm up on stage singing. I spent four years singing at the University of Miami with uh, Lee Chelson, and much of my conducting I stole from Lee, Lee Chelson. Chelson. What a good guy to steal from. And, Consequently, I enjoy conducting choirs, choruses as much as I do uh, bands, and still have an a cappella singing group that, that performs here in Broward County from time to time. And we have performed as far north as Dollywood. And uh, so we have gotten around in southeastern United States. But when I go to state to a convention, FMEA, I spend two thirds of my time in bands and I watch every band director that's there and I steal from every band director, and then I go into the chorus rehearsals and watch how they get those blended sounds and blend the vowels, because that's all we're doing. We're blending our tone qualities and vowels, and what do we do? How do we get them to listen? And then I go to the string, to the orchestra, to see what some of those markings that are in our band music, because when the transcriptions are written, sometimes they leave the bowing marks in. And so you have to understand what kind of bowing you're looking for in some of these pieces of music that we're playing. And so you've got to watch the directors in the orchestra to find out how they go. And you, who knows when you might end up, like I did, spending the last four years of your teaching career teaching orchestra. So out of 42 years of teaching, I spent, well, seven years and then the last three years. So the last 10 years of my career, I was teaching orchestra as well as band. And so you never know. So steal from everybody. That sounds kind of like anarchy, but it's something you need to do. 
you know. Did, oh, did you? I think I'm finished. You think you're finished? Yes. Excellent. So, um, if I asked you, like now in your retirement, you you still do your orchestra at church? Yes, I still direct an orchestra at church, and I direct a handbell choir, which is something else, because the melody line is never with one person. It bounces from person to person to person. Totally unusual. But everybody is in the same key. Same thing in the orchestra. Everybody's in the same key, and that's cool. I do get a chance to direct the choir from time to time, but I do still sing with, an, with a group. My eight-voice ensemble is down now. There's only five of us left. Many have moved away and other things, but we, we still sing, and I still play my instrument in the orchestra when I can, and I still play duets with my wife, and uh, that's one of the joys of my life. And that's another thing. If your family plays instruments, get together. There has been a time that my son and daughter and my wife and I played in pit of musicals that were semi-professional here in Broward County. And what a joy to look around in the orchestra and see your whole family. It's a cool, cool thing. So yes, I'm still busy and I am finally writing and arranging more. And that's a joy because that again is what I thought I wanted to be when I started off until I found out that I really love teaching. And so, that's where I am right now. I need to tell you this. If you're in teaching and don't absolutely love every minute of what you're doing, let me change that. There are some minutes that you don't love quite as much, and sometimes you want to step outside and talk to the stars and the trees. But ultimately, you love what you're doing or don't do it. Because if you're doing it for the money, if you haven't figured it out yet, there isn't any. And so you have to do it for the love. And when you see that light in the children's eyes, when they finally see what it's like to really make music and understand what they're doing, you can't beat that. So you have to love it. Gotta love it. So um, <clears throat> do you have a one, well, everything that you've said has been just fabulous, but um, you seem to be very satisfied with your choice of being a band director for your career. Totally. You know, and, um, and that's a beautiful thing. And you're right, there's not enough money in it if you don't love it. <laughs> Better figure that out soon. Um, is there anything that you would like to tell our young directors? You've given them a, a lot of information this afternoon, but anything that you would like to tell everybody before, we're, before we wrap up? Well, here's where I'm afraid of being redundantly repetitive. And I don't want to do that. That was a little humor there. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of things I, I threw in before I really wanted to throw them in. But you never, ever know what kind of an impact you're having on your students or the audience. That's why I say, don't, you know, you can't ever not sweat the small stuff. Uh, one year, and this is a story I have to share with you, uh, because I've heard directors say, well, this is good enough for your parents. We don't have to make it any better than this. Well, I was doing third suite, Jaeger's third suite, one time when I was at South Plantation. And one of my sweetheart bass clarinet players came to me and said, my uncle, who's a band director, is going to be here at your concert tonight. And uh, I just wanted you to know. And you might know him. And so there we were getting ready to play third suite, which I had sat at Allstate the year before and sat at the foot of Arnold Gabriel while he did the Allstate band doing Third Suite. And I looked in the second row of the audience and there was Arnold Gabriel, this young lad's uncle, sitting in front of me and I'm thinking, I hope I didn't say to them, this is good enough for your parents because there was Arnold Gabriel and he smiled politely through the whole program and did not come and throw things at me at the end of the program. So you never know who's gonna be there and you never know what state senator might be there. I, I had many invitations to play it, do some really cool things. We were the 1976 Bicentennial Honors Band at Disney World because a state senator heard one of our concerts and saw what we did and recommended to Lars Iverson, who was head of the artistic department at Disney World at the time. And he invited us to come up and play and then he invited us to come up the week of 4th of July and just perform <laughs> two performances a day from the 1st of July through the 5th of July. 
And so we picked the early morning parade and the midnight parade, and they paid all of our expenses except half of our bus buses going up there. He paid all of our rooms and all of our meals, and we were there for five days. And again, that state senator was in my audience and knew someone and recommended us. So you never know. So put your absolute best music forward all the time. Never ever settle. It has to be the way the composer intended it. That's what we do. We recreate the emotions that the composers wrote for us. And, and when you play with emotion, you touch people's hearts and lives. And that's what we need to do. I think I can't say it any better than that, Ms. Cole. I would, I would agree, Mr. Miles. So um, I think that around the state of Florida, people have been really keeping you in their thoughts and prayers since last year, um, well, early this year. And um, I, well, I do thank you for your thoughts and prayers. It has been a tough thing. And that lends me to say, take care of yourselves physically, folks. Take some time for your family. Don't forget to treat yourself OK because having a stroke is no fun. You lose a lot of weight, but you lose a lot, of, a lot of part of you that needs to be active and involved. So thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Thank you. I and love you all. Thank you, and we love you too. Thank you. Thank you.